Hey guys, Michael here, co-founder of Studicata. In today's video, I just wanna briefly go over the most frequently tested rules in civil procedure, at least if you're sitting for the uniform bar exam and taking the multi-state essay exam. These are the absolute critical must-know rules and civil procedure. Quick note before we jump into it, highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about the most frequently tested rules in each subject that you download our top 120 list. You can head over to our website, there'll be a link in the description. You can download that and you'll get the top 10 most tested rules in each subject. Highly recommend that you download that and know all of those rules ice cold by exam day because there's an extremely high likelihood that you're gonna run into several of those rules. But in this video, I just wanna focus on civil procedure, overview the, you know, my top five rules, what I think you absolutely have to know, what comes up again and again. Just wanna highlight some things that I see students sometimes mix up. Um, some are small things that only cost you a couple points. Some are really big things that can cost you a lot of points. Um, and just overview it in general. So without further ado, what are the most frequently tested rules in civil procedure. Well, starting at the top, the single most tested rule over the last 20 years has been diversity jurisdiction. Next, you have federal question jurisdiction. Next, you have venue. Fourth, you have supplemental jurisdiction. And the fifth most tested rule is personal jurisdiction. I realize personal jurisdiction is more of an analysis, not a single rule. But for our purposes in this video, I'm just gonna call it one rule. Okay, so let's take a step back and think about these top five rules, right? This makes a lot of sense probably to most of you. Um, in law school, you probably spent the majority of your time talking about jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, maybe not as much on venue, but definitely subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. And three of the top five rules that I just mentioned all fall under the umbrella of subject matter jurisdiction that being diversity, federal question, and supplemental jurisdiction are all a part of your subject matter jurisdiction analysis. So really, we can think of uh, civil procedure, we're thinking of the most frequently tested rules, we can think of it in terms of three categories, subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and venue. And so remember, subject matter jurisdiction deals with the particular type of case involved. You know, does the federal court have subject matter jurisdiction over this particular type of case is going to be the question there. Personal jurisdiction is going to be whether the court has jurisdiction over this particular defendant. And venue deals with the locality, right? Is this venue proper in the proper judicial district? So. What's interesting is all three of these are going towards kind of the same issue, and that's all about the authority of the court. Does the court ultimately have the authority to hear and decide the case before it? It has to have all three things. It has to have subject matter jurisdiction over the type of case being heard, personal jurisdiction over the defendant, and venue in the proper judicial district. If any of these three things are missing, then the court cannot hear the case. It doesn't have the authority. That case is going to have to be heard in another court. So all of the most frequently tested rules in civil procedure are going towards that issue. Does this court have the authority to hear and decide the case before it? And remember, subject matter jurisdiction is dealing with mainly federal courts, right? Subject matter jurisdiction is said to be unlimited in state courts. State courts have unlimited subject matter jurisdiction, which basically means that they can hear almost any type of case, right? They'll hear your $20 breach of contract claim against your grandma in a, in a state court. It's, it's unlimited subject matter jurisdiction. They can almost hear any type of case, you know, nothing, you know, any small claim, whatever, all of that little stuff can be heard in state courts. When you think of federal courts, you should think a little bit more formal, a little bit more highbrow. A case has to rise to a certain level to be worth it to be heard in a federal court, right? And certain types of cases have been deemed necessary to be heard in federal court. And those are the only types of cases, right? Those special cases that rise to that level that can be heard in federal court are said to be 
you know, valid for subject matter jurisdiction. And the main two there are going to be federal question and diversity, which just so happen to be the most frequently tested rules in civil procedure, right? Those two types of cases that are deemed special enough or formal or highbrow enough, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter what you're thinking about in your own head. By the way, this isn't the language that you should use in an actual essay answer, but when you're thinking about subject matter jurisdiction in your head, you want to think about it in terms of you know, it requires a certain a certain type of case to be heard, right? And the main two are going to be federal question and diversity. Um, and the, and, and the, if we want to talk about those real, really, really brief here, um, the main thing with federal question, if you remember, if the plaintiff alleges a claim that arises under federal law, then the federal court can obviously hear the case. The big mistake I see here made sometimes that you want to look out for is remember, under the well-pleaded complaint rule, it has to be pleaded. The issue of federal law has to be pleaded on the face of the plaintiff's complaint. So it doesn't matter what defense the defendant is raising. So if I sue you for a pure state law breach of action claim, you know, state law breach of contract claim, in federal court and you counter sue for you know some federal law defense that's not going to trigger uh, federal question jurisdiction it doesn't matter what the defendant is raising it's all about what the plaintiff pleads on the face of the complaint don't fall for that trap don't make that mistake diversity jurisdiction is a little bit more nuanced tricky remember there we're looking to see whether you have complete diversity and whether the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000. Um, complete diversity is present when every citizenship represented on the plaintiff side of the case is different from every citizenship represented on the defendant side of the case. So if you have two citizens from New York suing two citizens from the state of Texas, you have complete diversity. You know, if you have two citizens from the state of New York suing two citizens from the state of Texas and one citizen from the state of New York, you don't have complete diversity, right? You wanna look on both sides of the V, right? You wanna look at the plaintiffs and the defendants. If any citizenship matches on both sides of that V, you don't have complete diversity. Remember, quick note here on citizenship, individuals, you're a citizen in the state which you are domiciled, corporations have dual citizenship, uh, principal place of business and state of incorporation. Uh, don't want to make that mistake either. Normally, you'll see the state of incorporation is Delaware. Um, principal place of business, remember, is the nerve center test. Where are the headquarters located? That's how you're gonna usually determine um, the principal place of business for a business entity's citizenship. And remember, dual citizenship. Also, individuals can only be domiciled in one state at a time. I've seen that confused before as well. Can only An individual can only have one state or country of citizenship. Um, okay, next. So that covers um, federal question and diversity, which remember, those are your two most frequently tested rules. And those are both dealing with subject matter jurisdiction, whether the case rises to that level where a federal court can hear it. Remember, subject matter jurisdiction is all about whether the federal court can hear it. Um, another thing worth pointing out here, another note to make, is you do not want to discuss federal question jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction, or anything that has to do with subject matter jurisdiction if you are dealing with a state Court. Remember, state courts have unlimited subject matter jurisdiction. You don't need federal question jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction for a state court. So do not discuss subject matter jurisdiction in any capacity if you're dealing with a state court. It only applies to federal courts. So remember, the third most tested rule in the subject matter jurisdiction umbrella is supplemental jurisdiction which some students find a little bit confusing, but it's actually really simple. Uh, how to identify a supplemental jurisdiction issue is usually gonna come up when you have multiple claims. So if the plaintiff is bringing multiple claims against the defendant or the defendant is countersuing the plaintiff, you need to start thinking about supplemental jurisdiction. The way this works is, 
if the if you establish that the court has valid subject matter jurisdiction under either federal question or diversity and there's an additional claim floating around out there that the court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction under it can actually hear that additional claim even though it doesn't satisfy federal question or diversity if the claim constitutes the same case or controversy of another claim that does satisfy subject matter jurisdiction. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, you know, basically, like I said, the main thing is when you have multiple claims, you need to be thinking supplemental jurisdiction. Supplemental jurisdiction allows a federal court to hear an additional claim over which it would not independently have subject matter jurisdiction. Um, if the claims constitute the same case or controversy, which is you know common nucleus of operative fact, which is same transaction or occurrence, and in our attack ally in the system, we explain all those concepts out more. Um, you're gonna wanna hit all of those buzzwords when you're talking about supplemental jurisdiction, right? If you're dealing with an additional claim, uh, you're, you're gonna want to talk about whether that additional claim, ultimately, you're gonna wanna talk about whether that additional claim arises out of the same transaction or occurrence as the claim in which the court already has valid subject matter jurisdiction. That's what that whole analysis is going to come down to. Um, and, and remember, if it's a countersuit, you have, if it does arise out of the same transaction or occurrence, you know, then, so maybe I should actually give an example here. I, this is gonna be a longer video. Uh, so, uh, say that I sue you for copyright infringement, right? We produce a lot of copyrighted work here at Studicata, and maybe I'm alleging that you've, you know, infringed on our copyright somehow, right? So I sue you for copyright infringement. You, as the defendant, countersue me for breach of contract, which is a pure state law action. Remember, cop copyright infringement is federal law. That's in the Constitution. So that's going to trigger federal question jurisdiction. So when I sue you for copyright infringement and say I'm suing you in federal court, that's completely valid. The court, that federal court is going to have subject matter jurisdiction over the claim because the face of my complaint is alleging a claim that arises under federal law. So federal question jurisdiction is triggered. But your countersuit, right, is a pure state law breach of a, a breach of contract claim, right? It doesn't trigger federal law. And say we both reside in the state, or we're both citizens of the state of New York. So there's no diversity, right? No diversity. Um, so that court, that federal court, would not have subject matter jurisdiction over your breach of contract claim uh, by itself. But because it is an additional claim to our suit. It may have uh, subject supplemental jurisdiction if your claim, your pure state law breach of contract claim arises out of the same transaction or occurrence as my copyright infringement claim, then we say that the claims constitute the same case or controversy, in which case that federal court that couldn't have otherwise heard your pure state law breach of contract action will actually now get to hear it because it uh, because of it has supplemental jurisdiction, right? Um, hopefully that makes more sense. If not, uh, again, check out, uh, I just can't recommend enough that you check out our attack outline, go over to the website. I'm gonna go into things in much more detail there, probably explain it all out a little bit better. But anyways, that's three of our top five rules, right? And that's subject matter jurisdiction, in a nutshell, what you need to know. Federal question jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction, and supplemental jurisdiction. So the other two rules that are commonly tested are personal jurisdiction and venue, your other must know rules. So let's talk about personal jurisdiction next. Um, so the difference, the main thing to immediately from a big picture realize about personal jurisdiction is this applies to state courts and federal courts. Hey, remember, when we were talking about subject matter jurisdiction, I said don't talk about this if you're dealing with a state court. Personal jurisdiction, doesn't matter if it's state or federal, you have to talk about this if it's at issue. It applies to both state and federal courts. And personal jurisdiction is dealing with whether or not the court involved has the authority to adjudicate the rights and liabilities of this 
particular defendant. So if we said subject matter jurisdiction is all about the type of case involved, personal jurisdiction is all about the type, uh, not the type, about this particular defendant. Um, for example, for example, say that for example, say that I have never been to Alaska, and this is true. I've never been to Alaska in my entire life. I have zero contact with Alaska. I don't know a single person from Alaska. I own no property in Alaska. Literally zero contact with Alaska. Well, let's say that I get into a car accident with another person, and let's say that Alaska has great personal injury laws. I don't know if that's true or not, but say, Alaska is the most plaintiff friendly state in the country. So this is a savvy plaintiff who's just gotten into a car accident with me. And he says, hey, look, Alaska's got these great personal injury laws. I'm gonna sue Michael in Alaska where I can get the most amount of damages because their laws are way better. Um, he's not going to be able to do that, right? You can't just select any jurisdiction to sue somebody in. Well, you can, but they're not going to have personal jurisdiction over me. I have no contact with the state of Alaska. I'm not domiciled there, you know, and, and we can talk about that in a, in a minute, but because I have zero contact with Alaska, I can't be sued in Alaska. That court, that Alaska court does not have personal jurisdiction over me, the defendant. So personal jurisdiction protects the defendant from being sued, you know, just in any jurisdiction, right? And the way personal jurisdiction uh, an analysis looks, right? So how does a court obtain personal jurisdiction over a defendant? You're starting with the traditional bases first, right? If the court, if any of the traditional bases are satisfied, then a court is going to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant. The traditional basis being domicile, physical presence, consent, and waiver. So if I'm domiciled in Alaska, uh, the Alaska court has personal jurisdiction over me. If I am physically present in Alaska and I am served while physically present in Alaska, generally Alaska is going to have personal jurisdiction over me. Um, if I consent, if, I, if I'm sued in Alaska and I consent to that, then the Alaska court can have personal jurisdiction over me. If I waive my objection for lack of personal jurisdiction, then the Alaska court will have personal jurisdiction over me. And you can waive personal jurisdiction by substantial participation on the merits. So if I show up and substantially participate in Alaska, I'm gonna waive that objection for lack of personal jurisdiction. Big mistake, right? Um, which notably, you can't waive your objection for lack of subject matter jurisdiction that only applies to personal jurisdiction. And I have seen that confused before as well, especially more on the multiple choice portion, but also in the essay portion, a good thing to know. Um, so that if any, those are your four traditional bases, which are your which is your starting point for an analysis in personal jurisdiction. But even if none of the traditional bases are satisfied, remember a court can use a state long arm statute to reach an out of state defendant um, if that out of state defendant has minimum contact with the forum state, right? And remember your your minimum contact analysis. You discussed this probably at length. In, in law school, you read a bunch of cases about it. A minimum contact analysis is dealing with that threshold level of contact with the forum state where then a court is going to have personal jurisdiction over a defendant. So what level of contact does the defendant have to have with the forum state in order to trigger personal jurisdiction is what that analysis is dealing with. And generally you have specific jurisdiction and general jurisdiction, which are both going to be enough of a threshold of contact to then trigger personal jurisdiction. Um, general jurisdiction is just if the defendant's uh, contact with the forum state is so systematic and continuous that he's essentially at home in the forum state, then the court's gonna have general jurisdiction, which is gonna let them have personal jurisdiction of the defendant. 
Um, specific contact with the form state is also, or specific jurisdiction deals with specific contact with the form state. Um, this is remember if you purposefully avail yourself to the benefits of the form state in a manner that is foreseeable that you could be hailed into court there, um, that's going to trigger person or that's going to trigger specific jurisdiction, which is then going to grant the court personal jurisdiction of the defendant. And that's dealing with you know specific contact. The the car accident happened in Alaska, right? Um, so that is your personal jurisdiction analysis in a nutshell. Remember, you start with the traditional basis. If those aren't satisfied, you don't give up. You go to the state long arm statute and see if you can get minimum contacts through either general or specific jurisdiction. Okay, so that is four of the five most frequently tested rules in civil procedure. The last one to look out for is venue. This one comes up a lot. Venue is really straightforward. That just deals with the judicial district within the state. You know, you're thinking of a locality when you're thinking about venue. Um, the main thing to think about here is when you're determining venue, you need to think about residence. When you're determining diversity, you're thinking about citizenship of a, of a state or country. Um, so for instance, you can be a citizen of the state of California, right? When you're, when you're determining diversity and you're determining citizenship for diversity purposes, you're saying the plaintiff is a citizen of California and the defendant is a citizen of Texas, so we have complete diversity. Venue is saying within those states, within the state of California, within the state of Texas, what judicial district do those parties reside in? Um, and, and that's a little bit different than citizenship. And, and it's a little bit nitpicky because you'll often come to a similar result. But remember, if you're talking about venue and you're determining venue, you want to focus on the residence. What judicial district do the parties reside in? And that's going to be localities within the state. Okay, so that I think covers broad strokes overview of the most tested rules in civil procedure. Again, if you want more information, I highly recommend you head over to the link in the description. You download our full top 120 list. It's going to lay it out for you much more clearly for every subject, not just civil procedure. Um, with that, guys, I'll leave you to it and I'll see you at our next video.